Let's pray. God, your word is living and active. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. You've promised that you will send it out and it won't return to you until it has done what you have desired. And so, God, we pray that this morning your word will go out and that it will do all that you desire. In Jesus' name, amen. We talked last week of the hugeness of sin, its insidious presence in every one of us and in every part of our heart. We recognize that no human being has ever conquered sin through their own efforts. It was depressing to hear and hard. But, and I love that word, But, but we heard of a God who set his face like stone to save us, who loved us so much despite our sin that he did what only he could do. He set in place a rescue mission unlike any other before or since. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Isaiah 55. Nowhere is that seen more than in the rescue plan of God. In Hebrews chapter 7 to the end of 10, a phrase keeps popping up. It's the phrase, once for all time. It speaks of the work of God in Christ and it makes reference back to the way things used to be in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament from the time of Moses, God gave his people priests those who would stand before God on behalf of the people and make regular sacrifices for their sins. But the effect of these sacrifices didn't last. Why? Because sin was always present. It never stopped. It never died. It never surrendered. It could never be beaten. The sacrifices that the priests, who were also sinful, made could never be enough. And so the people were locked into a never-ending ritual of sacrifice. Their priests could never sit down because their work was never done. Hebrews 10 says this, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped for the worshippers would have been purified once and for all. A system that is repeated over and over again, always trying to achieve an unachievable end, that's ritual. Trusting a system that has no power to give what it promises, that's empty ritual. In Jesus' day, there were even levels of ritual keeping achievement. The more you could keep, the more people would honor and respect you. Oh, on the surface, it looked and sounded holy and godly and good, but it wasn't. Jesus addressed it and earned enemies as he did so when he spoke to the Pharisees, those most respected in society, those who represented God among people, the thoroughly ritualistic and most senior of the Jewish leaders. In verse after verse, Jesus is blunt. Woe to you, you Pharisees and teachers of the law. You load ritual onto the shoulders of people and lord it over them. 
Matthew 23. One of the signs of empty ritual is the sense of pride and superiority it can bring. It's all about what we are doing and we are achieving. And so that easily becomes a comparison game where I can compare myself with others and feel superior or inferior. What Jesus was addressing directly was the lie deep in the heart of man that actually we can save ourselves and that we don't need God. It's amazing how persistent this belief is and how it gets everywhere. We enter and hold tightly to the promise and reassurance of ritual without understanding how empty it is. You know this sort of thing. I go to church once a week, so that balances the stuff I do in between. I make sure I help others because that means God will love me more. I'm the first one to volunteer and the last one to leave because if I work hard, surely that counts with God. It makes me a good person. I make the sign of the cross and say liturgy and feel virtuous and that somehow puts credit in the bank with God. I read my Bible and pray every day because then my day will go well and God will be pleased with me. I give money and time and energy or whatever I have to give and I have a warm glow of credit with God. I keep all the rules because that's what good people do. They all sound good things, but when they're being used to score points or rebalance wrongs or earn favor, they're empty and they are rituals. The people of Israel did the same thing. They followed rituals, thinking that the ritual was the thing that counted. And just like us, they could never stop. Because if we do, then somehow our credit accounts slip and our goodness as a person is compromised. But here's a quiet question. What lies beneath these rituals? What drives them? Peel back the layers and look beneath and you'll see the independent spirit that lies there. The unwillingness to acknowledge sin, the pride and arrogance, false security and contempt for others that flows from it. The false humility, the effort to sort myself out before I approach God, the determination that I'm God and that he isn't. Ritual is like a valiant effort at air freshening over the rank smell of decay. It masks it slightly but doesn't deal with it. It has no power to because ritual misses the whole point. You see, ritual is man-made. There is no ritual that will ever win us right relationship with God. There is no ritual that will ever defeat sin and its power and reign in my life. Ritual has no power. Instead, it carries an illusion. If I do this, then everything is okay. If I do this, then God will love me. If I do this, then he'll be pleased with me. If I do this then he might forgive me if I do this. Does that sound familiar? Locked into a never-ending cycle of ritual, of trying to gain favor with God, of trying to be a good person, or what the Bible calls righteous. It sounds exhausting. It sounds empty. And it's all about doing. And it's all about God responding to me. And that's always the wrong way round. Listen to Paul the Apostle, who was a master of the ritual. He said this in Philippians 3, We put no confidence in human effort, although I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if anyone, if others have reason for confidence in I their own even efforts, more. I Listen to the independent, I can fix me attitude. I was circumcised when I was eight days old, following ritual. I am a pure blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if ever there was one, following ritual. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law following ritual. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church following ritual. 
And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault, following ritual. As far as ritual goes, he has it made, seriously. But he goes on, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because what of, of what Christ has done. Do you hear the switch? He sees them as they truly are, worthless. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite not value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I no longer rely on myself, he says. I no longer rely on the ritual of doing. It's all worthless. At first, he says, I thought it was all about what I do. But then he re reaches the point where it's only about what Christ has done. But what does he mean? God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Grace, that is, undeserved kindness, is all about what God has done for us and how we respond to him. Paul says in Romans 5, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you hear? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not after I sorted myself out, not when I felt worthy of it. No. God loved me so much, he sent his one and only son, that if I believe in him, I will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus himself said that, recorded in John 3.16, and he would know because he was talking about himself. But surely it's not that easy. You mean I can lay down everything that I'm doing and God will still love me? You mean I can come to him like this and he will give me life? You mean he will free me from sin? Oh God, where are the empty rituals in me? Where am I imprisoned by the lie that they promise? Can I really just come to you? Is it truly possible that there's a once and for all rather than having to keep on trying? God knows the extent of the sin in my heart and yours. He knows the emptiness and exhaustion of rituals. He knows their lie and distortion of all that's true. He knows their never-endingness and so he did the once for all. Jesus came Scripture in Hebrews calls him our great high priest with capital letters. He fulfilled all that was needed. The old system required a perfect sacrifice, so he gave himself without sin. The old system demanded sacrifices over and over and over again, but Jesus gave himself once and for all because he was without sin. He was perfect. The old system meant that the priests could never sit down because their work was never done. But Jesus sat down. It keeps saying that in Hebrews, when he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Chapter 1. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. That's chapter 8. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. That's chapter 10. He sat down. Why? Because it was done. Completed. Done. The old system was full of ritual, doing, to earn God's favor. Jesus says... Trust what I have done. 
release the rituals. There's nothing you can do to earn God's favor and be perfect before him, but I can and I have, he says. And so the way to life is to trust what I have done. Mary didn't recognize him in the garden until he spoke her name. And then she knew him, and all she wanted to do was hold on to him. He knows your name too. Behind him is an empty tomb where sin and death could not overcome. In him is an invitation to lay aside your rituals, acknowledge and confess the true state of your sin-filled heart, and receive from God what your soul is longing for. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, says John in 1 John. Nothing you can do will make him love you more. He's already proven that. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I've done it all. It is finished, done. There is nothing left to do. Come.